welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Again, my name is Brant Williams. I, I'm pleased to bring us all together here today for a conversation about the Minnesota Homeless Study. Uh, it's it's important role that, that, that it plays in addressing homelessness in our state as well. Uh, in my role as a reporter at NPR News, I've had the privilege of digging into some of these issues that uh, really impact our community. Um, and of course, I've also relied on information from the Wilder study um, in my reporting as well. Uh, this is really a unique opportunity, I think, for us to kind of dig under, look under the hood at this effort that for 30 years has really helped inform uh, public policies and strategies to respond to our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness. It's a, it's a worthy cause. Uh, we're really glad that you've made time to join with us today. So as we uh, all gather in, here in the depths of, depths of winter at our, from our respective homes, uh, you know, I think we can find common ground in the value of having a home with basically a safe place to, to live, to work, rest, and to play. Um, of course, the pandemic has magnified the importance of home and has really put stressors on families and the emergency housing network as well. So we've structured today's event uh, as a conversation with three experts who are dedicated to ending homelessness. Um, and our goal for today is to um, let you get you more of an idea of the scope uh, and the role of the Minnesota Homeless Study, uh, how that information from the study is used to shape responses and hopefully you'll get some, uh, we want you to have some actionable ideas on how you can support the study. Uh, we have a, a nice mix of guests today. Some of you, of course, are familiar with the study. Um, others are learning about it probably for the first time. Uh, with that in mind, we'll kind of keep the information high level. And uh, if there are any questions that we don't get to this hour, uh, we'll do our best to kind of follow up with you afterwards. <clears throat> uh, of course, before I introduce our speakers, um, I want to share a little housekeeping items with you. Many of you, of course, are probably familiar with using Zoom platform, but just in case, we're going to uh, give you some, some housekeeping uh, items to follow. Uh, we're auto we've automatically muted, folks, uh, your audio, but we've enabled your video uh, so you can see who else is on the call. Um, if you'd like to turn off your video, you can do so at the bottom of the Zoom screen by clicking the stop video button. Uh, to focus your screen, we recommend that you go to the speaker view. Um, in the corner, right-hand corner of your Zoom window. Um, and this event is being recorded and we'll be putting this online at a later, a later point. Uh, we're also encouraging folks to use the chat function. Uh, this is a section at the right-hand part of your screen um, where you can enter questions for our speakers as they go through their presentations. And to kind of give us a warm up, um, let's do a little test here. Uh, everybody, if when you get a chance here, just go to the, your chat window and type in a word that sums up home for you. And go ahead and, and share that in the chat so we can get an idea of how it's working. I don't know about you, um, I'm a pet owner. Home is where my cat is, so I'd maybe just put cat. I don't know. For others of you, it might be different. And I'm seeing some coming. Family, warmth, cozy, safety, definitely cat. Lots of cat owners out there. Good to see. Security, yes. <clears throat> so our, um, our program is going to begin today with a presentation of an overview, basically, of the Minnesota Homeless Study by, the, by its director, Michelle decker Gerard. And after she gets done, I'll ask her a couple questions, and then I'm going to introduce two more guests. We're going to talk to Kathy Tenbrook. She's the Assistant Commissioner and Executive Director of the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness. And we're also going to speak with Dave Schultz. He is a Metro State University professor, and Dave is also a longtime Homeless Study volunteer. Uh, and of course, we want you to submit your questions uh, to Michelle, Kathy, and Dave with the chat function. And we're going to uh, use those for a final round of Q&A as well after we get through speaking with, uh, with our guests. And so uh, this is an opportunity, I, I think, that will help make this a richer conversation. And um, I, I don't want you to be shy. Ask, ask away. Fire away. So it's my pleasure right now to introduce Michelle Jack decker Gerard. Um, she is a senior research manager with Wilder Research. Uh, she's worked for the Minnesota Homeless Study since it began in 1991. Uh, Michelle has worked for over 25 years as a community-based evaluator with a focus on people experiencing a variety of risk factors, including mental health and complex health issues, chemical dependency, and homelessness. Uh, as the director of the Minnesota Homeless Study, 
Uh, Michelle leads a team that coordinates nearly 5,000 interviews with people experiencing homelessness on a single night. Uh, Michelle has a master's degree in education uh, with a focus on risk and prevention from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much for being here. I'm looking forward to, to your presentation. And of course, after you uh, get done here, we, I'm gonna ask you for more questions and then we can hear from, uh, from our guests who are joining us as well. Michelle, take it away. Awesome, thanks, Brant. Um, it's so great to see so many faces um, being in the pandemic. Um, I haven't seen many of you in a while and I see some familiar people out there, including my mentor and the first lead of the homeless study, Greg Owen, who's um, here today as well. So shout out to Greg. Um, I am going to share my screen right now and, and go through some basic information from the homeless study, and then we'll have some opportunity for questions. So here I go sh sharing my screen. Great. Technology is working. That's always the first battle, right? Um, so, um, so just going to do a brief overview of the study, uh, if I can get it to work. Nope, gonna just do a new share of a different screen. Aha. All right, so in terms of um, some of you, I know are familiar with this study. I recognize some of the faces and some people it's new to. Um, so you can maybe put in the chat if you're interested, if you've actually been a volunteer on our study. We always kind of want to acknowledge our volunteers because they're just such a huge part of making the study happen. So you can either raise your little Zoom hand or put it in the chat and so we can acknowledge you. We've been doing, as Brant said, the study statewide since 1991, every three years. Um, and what we do is we go to every emergency shelter, transitional housing, and domestic violence shelter in the state on a single day, single night. Um, and we also work with outreach people and professionals to interview people who are not staying in shelters. So we go to food shelves, uh, we go to campsites, um, along with professionals, um, and interview folks staying there. Um, we use uh, volunteer interviewers, although some of the volunteers are professional outreach staff so that um, everyone's kept safe for some of those outreach locations. Um, and we train the volunteers via the most exciting YouTube video you've ever watched on social science research methods. Um, so maybe David can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and the funding has always been a mixed funding source. It's a mix of public money, government money, um, state funded, um, some county funded, and private partners, including um, foundations, some of the folks who are on the call. Um, and so it's been purposeful as a mix of funding sources to make sure that um, it's very publicly available, nonpartisan, and everybody um, sort of can use the data in whatever purpose they want to. So we make it available via our website, and then people can request um, the data to use for other uh, uses. For instance, Catholic Charity requests the data to look at um, people served through their system. The last time we conducted the study was October 25th, 2018, which seems like ages ago. And we're actually planning to get conducted again this next October. Um, so it's scheduled for October 28th, 2021. Um, it's a little bit different than some other sort of counts of homeless folks in that we do extensive face-to-face 45 -face minute interviews with people experiencing homelessness. So we do those in the shelters and then again in non-shelter locations. And we translate the interviews into whatever the common languages are spoken by folks um, who are staying in shelter. So last time it was Spanish and Hmong. Um, and then folks who participate in the study get paid a $10 cash stipend uh, for participating in the study. Um, and then one of the things I wanna note just from those folks who have volunteered in my experiences um, interviewing folks as um, a, a person an interviewer for the study is that experience is, is a profound experience. You really get to know um, the story of, of the people you're talking to. And then we also, in partnership with um, Native sovereign nations, do a study, a companion study on American Indian reservations. And so last time we did the study, we had six Ojibwe reservations, Northern o reservations that um, participated in the study, did a very similar study to the statewide study. 
um, because they're sovereign nations, they own the data um, and then um, they release it as an aggregate um, to, the, to the public. So I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, so one of the big uses of this data is to look at trends over time. And since we've been doing this study since 1991, um, you can see that there has been an increase in people experiencing homelessness over the course of that nearly 30 year time period. Um, one of the things that I point out on this slide is that when we first started doing the study back in 1991, there was a little over 3000 people experiencing homelessness in our whole homeless population that day we did the study. Today, there are more children experiencing homelessness than the entire population when we first did the study. So that's um, sort of a very depressing and bad news situation. Um, also during the 2018 study for the first time we did, um, we were able to add the folks experiencing homelessness who met the federal definition of homelessness, who were staying, um, who we interviewed on reservations. And so that's that little dot right up here, 11,371. So our trend line shows our statewide count for our statewide study of 10,200. And then we added an additional 1,100 people who were literally homeless on reservations. We also use our data to come up with estimates because there's no way that you can actually interview all people experiencing homelessness in a single night study. Um, one of the things we find is that homelessness, a lot of homeless folks experience um, just short-term homelessness and are very invisible to the rest of the population. They might stay in their car a night, um, that type of thing where they don't really show up in the shelter system. Also, there's a lot of invisibility and homelessness in suburban areas and rural um, areas where there aren't as many shelters available. So there's a lot of um, different ways that people are trying to access a place to stay. So we use an estimating technique based on our survey data as well as some other information. And on any given night, nearly 20,000 people are experiencing homelessness in our state. And during the course of the year, a little over 50,000 people. And we believe these are conservative estimates. One of the things that sometimes surprises people is that children and youth make up almost half of our homeless population. So children staying with their parents or unaccompanied youth age 24 and, on, and younger who are on their own without their parents. Um, the other thing I think that is a surprise to folks is what um, that 10% of our homeless population are older adults age 55 and older. And that's a growing group of our homeless population. There was a 25% increase in our older adult population between 2015 and 2018. And that's an area of big concern for those um, working um, in the homeless system, particularly right now during the pandemic where those folks are particularly vulnerable. And we can talk a little bit more about that later. So just gonna give you a quick overview of findings from our last study. So big finding um, normally when we do the study is just that need for more affordable housing. And, and Kathy, um, when she talks, we'll talk about all the state's efforts um, to work on this issue. Um, so what we find is um, the homeless population really needs housing subsidy to be able to afford housing. So section eight and other um, ways of making rent affordable for people experiencing homelessness. And half of our homeless adults said that they were on a waiting list for that type of subsidized housing. And another 10 to 15% couldn't even get on the waiting list because it was closed, it was full. So that's a big area of concerns. And when we ask folks um, what sort of led to their homelessness or, or what will get them out of homelessness, over half says, said that what led to it was that there was no housing that they could afford. And that's the, we asked multiple different reasons and that's the highest reasons. Then the other thing is what folks, um, including the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless talk about as the math problem. So the median income for our homeless population, our homeless adult population is 550 a month. The median rent in the Twin Cities is over $900 a month for a one bedroom apartment. So you can see there is that huge gap and without some type of subsidy, there's no way people can afford those rental units. The other issue is of course that our um, rental vacancy rate is very, very low um, in, in the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota. It hovers between one and 3% vacancy rates. So people with the barriers um, who are homeless, literally homeless are competing for housing with people who are not homeless and, and often lose out. 
The other big finding from our 2018 study was um, the increase in people who were staying outside of a formal shelter setting. There was a 62% increase over 2015. If you recall in 2018, that was a time when we had some large encampments, including the Hiawatha encampment, the Wall of Forgotten Natives. There was some encampments near Cathedral Hill in St. Paul and some other um, encampments. Um, one of the things that we do know is there was, there was actually, those got the most press, but there was encampments all over the state um, during that study. Um, and so folks were not able to access space um, or were choosing to stay in those encampments because they didn't like the options that were available. They might have been too full or not welcoming. Um, a third of our population also um, for the overall population had been turned away from a shelter in the last three months because of um, lack of space. One of the things that I did on the night of the study, I ended up the night um, with a couple of our folks, some of whom are on this um, call at the Target Field um, train station. And we interviewed folks who were sleeping on the train. And at that point on the green line between two and 300 people a night were um, sleeping on the train. So th there was this huge concern about that and we're still facing that today. Uh, one of the questions we do ask on the survey is, where have you stayed in the last month? And the story behind this is one of the things I just want to communicate is that people sort of cobble together a lot of different options as places to stay over the course of time. So about a quarter of our homeless population had spent more than a week literally outside in the past month of the study, which was October, um, including 22% of youth age 24 and younger. And then for our youth population in particularly, um, many of them also do couch surfing, couch shopping, or staying doubled up with others. And um, you can see that 38% of our youth population had spent more than a week doubled up in the past month. So they use shelter, they spend some nights on couches, they stay outside, they might ride the train or a bus, um, trying to cobble together places to stay. Another big finding of our study is this intersection um, that is occurring between different health issues. And over the course of time of doing this study since 1991, we've seen an increase in folks experiencing mental health issues and chronic health problems. Those trend lines have gone up. For substance abuse disorder, that trend line has stayed relatively flat between 22 and 24 percent. But this is an area of concern. So when we're planning services for our homeless population, we really need to take into account um, the mental health issues and then these chronic physical health conditions. Again, particularly during COVID where health conditions can really exasperate the illness. Um, and again, we're not trying to hit every issue. Um, this could be the whole hour if I presented everything, but one another concern that we have is people fleeing or experiencing domestic violence who end up homeless. So uh, we've seen an increase in the number of women who left their last housing because of abuse. Um, and it is something again, that is a very concerning trend. So this is a complicated slide and I just wanted to highlight it um, to, um, to help explain some of the uh, underlying issues faced by people experience home and experiencing homelessness. And this is particularly highlights trauma in childhood. So one of the things that the Center for Disease Controls has identified as causing health problems when you are older is these adverse childhood experiences. And some of you I'm sure have heard of them, ACEs. Um, so an ACE study um, has found that certain experiences in child can predict um, health problems later in life and other um, issues. And so for years, we have been asking some of these um, questions in our homeless study, but when the ACE study came out, we um, made a point to ask more of them. And so we asked about several different experiences in childhood. And one of the things that we found was that if a uh, if a person experienced, and, and I just wanna shout out to, to Brian Pittman and Walker Bosch, our analysts who really dug into this. Um, but the thing they found was that if um, a homeless person had some of these experiences, their average age of first becoming homelessness was so much younger than if they didn't have that experience. So you can see here, parents serve time in prison. If you had a parent who served time in prison, prison while you were a child, 
your average age of first experiencing homelessness was age 19 versus age 30 if you did not have a parent who had served time in prison as a child. And so this uh, information points to some possible intervention points. For instance, we can provide more support for families who might have a member incarcerated so that those families don't end up homeless. Um, if we can interrupt the cycle of homelessness, um, we can prevent homelessness later in life. Um, so that is a really important thing to dig into. Another issue um, that we really think is important to address is the ripple effects from racism and discriminatory practices that really um, are impacting our homeless population. So the blue line in this slide shows what our Minnesota adult census population is, and the orange line shows what our homeless population. And you can see here that 5% of our um, Minnesota adult population is black or African-American, but 37% of our homeless population is black or African-American. And if we look just at families alone, it's half of our homeless population are black and African-American families. So this disproportionality um, is particularly true for black or African-American folks, as well as our native folks. Um, and so again, to understand this, we have to think about generational issues. For instance, thinking about earlier in the 20th, 20th century when redlining or other discrimination caused um, non-white folks to not be able to buy homes in different communities. Um, the GI Bill that also um, was helpful for white home ownership, but not for non-white home ownership. Um, some impacts of welfare policies, et cetera, et cetera. Just um, policy upon policy upon policy that occurred that sort of assisted whites and, and brought down other folks, um, people in indigenous and people of color. The other thing um, that we want to note is that um, for our homeless population, they are disproportionately LGBTQ. 10% of homeless adults are LGBTQ and 22% of homeless youth are LGBTQ. Um, and so again, in thinking about policies, we wanna make um, our programs, our housing programs, et cetera, welcoming and safe for these populations. So that's just a quick overview um, because we have such great speakers today. Besides me, I can take a few questions, but I also <laughs> just wanted to do a shout out to Dave and Kathy because they are two of my heroes in this world. <laughs> and um, I'm really, really happy that they're on this, on this Zoom with me. Michelle, thanks so much for, for that information. And as you mentioned, um, we, I, I want to bring in Kathy and Dave here in a few minutes, but I, I do have one quick question for you in particular about conducting this study. Obviously, um, as you go out this year, we're hopeful that COVID-19 will be much more under control by October, by the time volunteers actually start engaging in, in the study. But I'm, I'm curious, just first of all, what precautions, what, what allowance are you making for sending volunteers out um, in, a, in a pandemic? Yeah, you understand sort of my nightmares at night, um, Brant. Um, yeah, um, there's something that we're really thinking about. In fact, you know, until recently, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to do the study in October. Um, it, it, from what I understand, the population experiencing homelessness are going to be some of the first folks to receive the vaccine. So that's great. We have been actually doing some investigating of getting donations of PPE equipment for our homeless volunteers. We will absolutely make sure that we can do it in the safest of all possible conditions. Um, we're actually doing some other studies over the summer that will be helpful in informing our homeless study to figure out the safest way to do things. Um, but we're really thinking a lot about that. Um, I think if you've been, if those of you who have been into homeless shelters lately have known that they've um, decreased uh, the population of shelters to make it a little more, more roomy in those um, facilities. And some folks are now staying in motels and hotels, particularly our vulnerable health population. So we'll have to figure out if that's still occurring, how to interview people who are way more spread out than the condensed shelters that we usually interview in. So it is something we're thinking a lot about. The study itself, even under normal conditions, is a logistical nightmare of trying to send you know, these 45 minute forms all around the state, um, coordinate all these interviewers and get them all to the right place at the right time. Literally, we have 
long meetings just to talk about where people will park. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, it's just quite something, um, but it's definitely worth it. And, and um, we'll pull a lot of Right. And another question too, just about um, to kind of follow up on something you touched on is obviously the pandemic's effect on the homeless population. And you mentioned some of the uh, measures that have been taken uh, that are underway that to help separate folks, make sure they're not in crowded situations, but help folks understand um, how is best you know how the pandemic has been impacting the, the homeless population. Yeah, and of course we'll know more from our study after 2018, I mean, after October, 2021. Mm -hmm. But what I do know from um, talking with different folks in the field is yeah, this, um, and Kathy probably can talk a lot more about this is that, yeah, they're trying to decrease the size of those who are staying in the emergency shelter system um, and place the highest risk folks into um, other places. They're trying to get people housed as quickly as possible. And some folks are um, camping um, because they feel safer. And so I think for all of us, we understand that in the pandemic, we don't wanna be in close quarters with other people. Um, and so that is one of the adverse um, effects of the pandemic is, is more people wanting to not be in shelter. Um, and so they've opened up some safe spaces and things like that for those folks to be able to go. So it is, it is quite, uh, it is quite a conundrum. We've uh, received some funding from the Federal Cares Act, et cetera, to be able to provide these hotel and motel spaces, which is great. Um, but again, what, how long is this thing going to last and how long can we maintain that? And just people are just really, like all of us in those situations, really bored and frustrated and just trying to, I mean, I think Another hero that we want to shout out in this world is folks that are working in those shelters as well as the people experiencing homelessness themselves. I mean, this is a hard, hard environment for all of us, but just think if you were in that situation. Right, right, exactly. Michelle, thanks so much for your presentation and, um, and keep up the good work. Yeah. Uh, I want to bring in to the conversation now, uh, Kathy Tenbrook. Uh, many of you are familiar with her, but uh, she is the Assistant Commissioner uh, and Executive Director of the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness. Uh, Kathy, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, really looking forward to talking with you. Um, first of all, um, I want to also mention that, and I've talked to you over the years from the work you've done. Um, I've, I've spoken to you when you were you worked for the city of Minneapolis. You coordinated the end of homelessness program there. You were a policy aide at Hennepin County. You've been the director of St. Stephen's Shelter in Minneapolis. Uh, and I should also add that you, you hold a master's in public policy at, from the Humphrey Institute. And you've been doing this for a, a very long time. Uh, thanks again for what you do and for joining us. Uh, Kathy, let me start by asking you just some, um, at, at the level you're at right now, just give us a sense of, of how the state is working in concert with um, not only cities like Minneapolis, but, but other agencies throughout the state in to, to prevent and end homelessness. Thanks so much, Brand. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see your faces. Just like Michelle, I was just like, oh, I just miss people so much. And I miss so <laughs> many of you. Hey, Eric. Um, and you're just such amazing partners in this work. So it gives me great joy to be with you. Um, so yeah, but I, there are some folks I've been scrolling through and there's some folks I don't know. And so maybe I'll just take just a minute and explain um, what the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness is just to help set the stage for the conversation. So in the role I'm in now, and I've been at the state now for eight years, um, in eight years ago, we launched this cabinet level body, which is made up of the commissioners of 13 different state agencies. And it's right now led by our Lieutenant Governor, it's co-chaired by the Housing Commissioner and the Human Services Commissioner. And along with those 13 state agencies, they are really the ones that help drive policy and budget focus uh, and work around trying to really ultimately create a system that frankly, I don't think we really have in the state of Minnesota, I would not call it a system, um, to prevent and end homelessness. And so lots of different pieces of work in, at play with the understanding that you know, no one of those agencies has all the tools they need, of course, to prevent and end homelessness and to create housing stability. Um, but each of them have a role to play, whether it's with a homeless specific resource like the Family Homeless Prevention Assistance Program or our shelter programs, 
or if it's with bigger mainstream systems that can have a tremendous impact on people experiencing homelessness like employment, education, mental health care, health care in general. Um, and so they're all working together to do that work. And they do that, of course, in partnership with literally thousands of partners across the state, local governments, tribal partners, nonprofits, people in shelters experiencing homelessness themselves. And so there's a lot of partnership that goes into this. Um, every you know couple of years, we really launch what we call a statewide action plan, or we have since 2013. And it's intended to really help collectively focus us all on goals and strategies that we think are most important. I will say, because we were just talking about COVID, um, this past year has been, you know, I, I, there's not enough words to describe what it's done to all of us who work on this issue and certainly um, uh, lots of it very challenging and very, very heartbreaking and lots of it very informative and very important for us to take what we have just learned together and sort of the rapid, creative, responsive ways that people have worked in, in, in ways we never had to figure out so quickly before. I think it's, it's made homelessness centered as the crisis and urgent issue that it always has been. But I think the pandemic really put the spotlight on that in so many ways and, and has really shifted a lot of our work. So I say that because I think that will really help inform what this next iteration of our statewide planning with our partners will look like, including local governments. Um, so to get to your question specifically, Grant, um, with, uh, with local partners, I would say in terms of resources and also in terms of roles and responsibilities, we've certainly been trying over the last several years to really figure out the best ways to coordinate and be as collectively on the same page as possible and strategic uh, with our resources. I think once again, using COVID as an example, I saw that happen more uh, than, I, than I've ever seen in all of my 28 years now of doing this work at various levels of government. So I've played, I've been in different hats um, of government, but um, getting to the point about COVID, for example, you know, when COVID hit, and I, and this is where I'll bring in the work with Wilder, of course, I remember in March when it came to Minnesota, um, just an enormous, um, urgency and fear for what it would mean for people experiencing homelessness who were very much in these very tight quarters and as we know from the data, um, lots of underlying health conditions and other reasons that, and, and an aging population, lots of reasons why they were very at risk of negative impacts of COVID. We use the wilder data to go to the governor and the legislature and say, we need to act quickly. This is, there's every reason that this is, should be a target population for our protection. And within weeks, we had $26.5 million from the legislature that we didn't have before that went out all across the state to local governments, to tribal partners, to nonprofits, to set up about 2,800 uh, spaces, hotel rooms and other spaces to decompress shelters, get people out, seniors and people with health conditions, also to set up isolation hotels if people did get sick, to have some place to isolate food, PPE, all the things you know, testing. Testing was a very, of course, important part of all of this. And so the collaboration was, was quite incredible across the state, the way people came together to just completely reconfigure their programs and do things differently and use money differently. And, you know, um, I have to give credit to my colleagues at, at the Department of Human Services who run the, it's from that um, OEO program, uh, the, uh, uh, they, they took the dollars that they got and they got them out in just record speed. Like I have just never seen a government entity move that quickly uh, with all the bureaucracy we usually have in place. So I wanna take all of that and say, let's not go back to all of the bureaucracy that gets in the way of us being that urgent with our resources and effective with our resources and figure out all the ways we can move forward um, move forward together. Just one more quick example. Um, you mentioned Minneapolis and Hennepin to, to talk about the encampments. You know, that was another place where very challenging. There's no doubt about it. So don't want to paint this as a rosy picture. It was one of the most challenging moments of my entire 
career uh, was this summer and all of the, um, the numbers of people sleeping outside. But I will say one of the things that just was remarkable to me is when we were working with people, you know, closest to the issue, um, you know, some of our culturally specific uh, nonprofit partners, for example, who said, here's what we want to do and build to help be part of the solution here. We had the city, the county and the state all come together and say, well, I have this pot of money that could do this piece of it. And I have this pot of money that could do this piece of it and essentially put the puzzle pieces together to open up more shelters, to, to try innovative, innovative programs, which frankly, you know, government's not great at innovative programs, right? But I think uh, everybody was willing to kind of go out on a limb and do something different. Um, so those are, there's so much to say, but that I will well, stop there. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that because that was really one of the main questions I wanted to ask you. And you had a great example of how the study has influenced policy, particularly when it came to the, the pandemic and addressing the immediate needs of yeah. the homeless, homeless population. Um, and I'd like to maybe expand on that or maybe ask you, what role do you see the study in playing in future um, policy that the, the state may be, may be under, in the works right now or that you'd like to see um, go forward, how can the study um, affect that? Yeah, that's great. Um, well, Michelle knows my dreams. I have, I have dreams, <laughs> Michelle, that we will figure out how to use all of these data sources in more you know, collective real-time ways. And, but I think every data source we have, you know, from the Wilder study, which I think is, has the most rich sort of in-depth information from people themselves about what they're experiencing and why that it's so valuable. And then we have other data sources that are a little more frequent, you know, maybe once a year. And then we have data sources from education and, you know, a veteran registry, which is more real time. Um, I want to use all of that to help move us to a place where we're, we, we just make sure we're not just describing the problem, but we're really using the data more effectively together to identify real-time solutions for what we're trying to accomplish and using Wilder's expertise and um, ability to help us figure out how to do that, I think is, a, is one of the ways I'd, I'd really like to work together um, going forward. Great. Well, Kathy, thanks so much. And uh, of course, we'll have time at the end of our presentations to, to ask, have folks ask some more questions and I'll have some more questions as well. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Dave Schultz. Uh, you probably know Dave, but if you don't, he's a professor of social sciences at Metro State University. He's also a longtime homeless study volunteer. Uh, Dave uh, is a, a teacher, as I mentioned. He teaches a course in uh, called Homelessness, uh, Critical Issues for Policy and Practice, and through which he has his students get involved in the homeless study. Um, and as I mentioned, Dave has been a, uh, a volunteer. He started since at the very beginning, so he's been there since jump. Uh, and so Dave, uh, we're excited to hear what you have to say about this. Uh, first, let me start by asking you just, you know, help us understand a little bit about the, the impact that doing this type of work has had on you um, as a person and as someone who's doing the work that you do. Oh, wow, that's a big question. Um, thanks, Brad, for um, that introduction. And it's great to see all of you as well. <clears throat> Being retired from the Department of Human Services uh, now for seven and a half years, I don't have as much day to day with all of you as I do in my daily or my yearly <clears throat> teaching of this class. So it, uh, likewise with uh, seeing everybody and especially uh, my special person in my life is Greg Owen and, and his work that he has done on this and now Michelle carrying that on. So <clears throat> I've played many roles in, in this data and it means so much to me. Um, I, think, I think I'll start at the end by saying, <clears throat> now I use this yearly in my class. This is my textbook. Um, there's been textbooks that have come and gone, but the one consistent since 1991 is to use this data in my class and to have my class uh, be able, to, as part of their service learning, which is what the class is also about, to use this data um, uh, and, and understand from a critical thinking point of view what homelessness is about. Um, and within that context, a little bit different from what Kathy was saying about they hope to be real time, what my class is doing and what it is as I'm teaching about this is 
here's the picture. How do we come up with policies that now do something to help solve this problem? Um, so my class now, the, the final product is to have a policy that's built upon uh, the data that's in this. Uh, one of the intermediate uh, class uh, parts that we did this last year was to not only talk about the uh, encampments that were going on in real time and how that data uh, fed into that, but then to take a look at the 2040 Minneapolis plan. The Minneapolis plan, 2040 plan has got a goal about housing and about homelessness. And we, we compared those as to how does that, does that policy that they're going for, that goal, really link together with this data. So this is just everything. This is, this is the richness of this data longitudinally. I mean, you can't say enough about the factor 1991, starting with this, um, which was 10 years, I might say, after um, the big boom in homelessness created. But we've been able to look at this and now from a science point of view, social science point of view, um, it, it just is, it's everything. Um, Dave, give me a sense too of, of I, I'm so curious to ask you more about how this has impacted your students in, in their, their worldviews um, by being a part of the study. Can you help me understand just how students react when, when they take part in this study? How does it change their perspectives? Well, we, we also do, I, I might add, a part on uh, that, that's called uh, ethnographic research, which is also having some face-to-face -face conversations with some people. But the basis of much of that comes from this, this study and the questions that get asked in it. So my, my students, um, most of them, have no clue about what homelessness is other than they want to fix it. That's the first thing. Uh, how do I fix this? Which I will immediately say to my class, this is not a social work. This is a social science. This is a social study class. This is sociology and studying it. So this grounds my students in taking a look at the whole, com the whole complexity, so to speak, of this problem, which um, I might say from my, my, my uh, work life um, before this study was even going was on in mental health. And so much can be said for me about uh, the study that has been longitudinally done that I talked to my students about in terms of the mental health issue. When we first began in 1991, 36% had a serious mental illness. Mm -hmm. I, uh, say now after I retired, after you know 2013, I said, I fixed that problem by the fact that it was only 57% then. Um, uh, that's why I got out of working, I think. Um, <laughs> but now it's huge. And so my students get a, get, a, get a look at the factor that we so frequently don't know uh, what really is going on. And, and Kathy's point, real time, this is real time in terms of every three years at least, that we get a picture of what it is that's changing and going on. You know, back in the 30s, and then my students, I talked to them about that, uh, substance abuse was the big issue. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any idea what mental health was about. Now we understand that, and now we understand how much that huge piece is. And then to lay on that, I might add, the race issue. I mean, George Floyd, brought to a lot of people the factor of what was going on. But even within the, our own, our own um, homeless system that we have, we have a racial issue uh, where, where shelters, homeless shelters, will take on anybody if they can, but then going into transitional housing and going to more permanent housing, somehow we lose some of the racial uh, equity, so to speak, in what's going on with helping to solve that problem. So right. this, this is everything to my students. My, my students see the, the immensity of that. And I might add, my students are many times not from this country. Hmm. Um, Metro State has got a huge number. In fact, this last class, um, because it was uh, virtual, <laughs> uh, yeah. had one student that was back in her home uh, country of Nigeria taking the class at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, so they, they look at this and going, oh, my God. 
this are, are they surprised? Are they not aware that that the United States has the type of issue that we have? No, with no. And in, in fact, they would argue the point that these people, because they're homeless, it's all their problem. Because some of them have come, like I had uh, some class, some uh, class people who came from Mexico, who said, "Hey, we came here and we haven't had these problems. Uh, we've been able to find work. We've been able to find housing." Uh, that's because we take care of our immigrant population in many ways, much better. And we give them a lot of opportunities that a per person that was brought to this country by slavery uh, right. and their culture uh, and or taken over their country in the name of American, that we have just um, annihilated in many ways their, their being. Um, and so the respect issue that they get from taking this class and looking at this data for who these individuals are, um, is, uh, again, it goes beyond my words. Right. You know, uh, Dave, we've, we've also heard a couple of questions from folks who are interested in, in being volunteers and are curious to know how they can do that. But from your experience, what should somebody know? What should they be thinking about um, if they want to get involved and do this type of work, such as volunteering uh, for the study? The so number one is listening to hear what the person is talking about. That, that is number one. If you wanna be prepared, come and read the question the way it's supposed to be read and then listen and be, um, be giving person respect to listen to what they have to say because it is so rich what these individuals will share. They share the factor that they've had suicidal aspects, you know, su suicidal ideation. They share the factor that they've been you know, abused as a child. These are some overwhelming things that, that you know, the students come back to and go, oh my goodness, they just, you know, they, they kind of go into it saying, okay, they're gonna get $10 for this. So they'll tell you anything. Uh, no, mm -hmm. be prepared by the factor that this is real and you get to talk with somebody and hear on their terms where things are at. That's the number one thing about t doing and volunteering for this. Right. And as you mentioned, your, your students, um, as a part of the class, they, after they do this work, uh, part of their assignment is to come up with a policy. Mm -hmm. um, have, um, can you give me a sense of what some of these policies are and have any of these, how far have they gone? Have we actually seen policies that your students have crafted wind up going into effect? Yes. Uh, we've actually had some of those. Uh, the most recent one that, that's, that's out there, uh, I might say, because I, there's, there's many that have gone there. In fact, uh, I think there's a few people on this uh, broadcast that I, that I recognize were a part of the class. Um, and, and generally, they, they get into the field by, by in that nature um, sometimes. Uh, but the, the most recent one was a person who as a part of my 30 students, I had one that had, uh, had to have two interpreters because she was both blind and hearing impaired. And so she was on this class um, and her motivation to be on it was to uh, try to help uh, solve the problem. And for her, it was helping to get phones to individuals who are hearing and sight impaired uh, that could connect for them um, how, to, how to hear and understand what solutions were. So she, she was wanting um, the homeless system to uh, get a hold of phones and get them to these individuals who needed them so that they could uh, get out of homelessness and, and, and find a way because they were, they were literally uh, by their handicap, uh, by their uh, accessibility issues, I uh, couldn't do that. She has put that forward and I, at least several of the cases, I don't know if she's done it yet, but has moved forward to uh, talk to the Homeless Coalition for for getting maybe a bill going or something that was at that level. So wow, that's, that's great. Um, uh, Dave, thank you so much for, for that information and for uh, sharing some time with us. And uh, we've got some, some time now that we can ask some more questions. Um, from our, our panelists here, Dave and Kathy and Michelle. Um, and uh, I, I do want to ask, there, we had a, a question earlier uh, for Kathy. I'm looking for it right now. 
um, to just basically help us understand the intersection between um, how federal, state, county, and city service uh, all work together and uh, help us understand if um, how they coordinate if they do. That is a really big, big question. Um, <laughs> not a simple answer, but I will do my best. Um, so, you know, the federal dollars flow to either the state or to local governments, depending on the source of federal dollars. So that's the, all of this sort of depends on which source it is. But for example, there's a, a source called the Emergency Solutions Grant. Some of those dollars go directly to counties that you know are of a certain size and have certain homeless population. And then some of those dollars come to the state with the intention that there are many areas of the state that don't get a direct allocation. So the state will do the, the work to you kind know, of balance of state is what we call it, where we get dollars out to those areas as well, with the attempt to make sure that every region has um, some portion of the, those dollars. I would say federal dollars is no surprise to anyone are typically our most restrictive. You know, they're the ones that come with the most directives and, and clarity of how they need to be used and targeted. And so I think one thing that we've really increasingly done better over the years is really think about state general fund dollars, county general fund dollars and others that we can be as flexible as possible with to try to fill some of the gaps that our federal dollars aren't able to fill. Um, you know, this, this COVID experience also was really informative in terms of how much sort of weaving of various resources you could pull together to make something happen. So a lot of our CARES Act dollars were woven with our state emergency services grant money, were woven with actually our, our, some of our federal emergency solutions grant dollars and then local county taxpayer dollars. So, you know, you would sort of weave all of this together to create an actual opportunity um, where we could bring people in um, and then use, you know, depending on where it was or what was happening, using some different state dollars to then work on the housing outcomes out of that shelter or hotel that's been stood up. And so it's a lot of, it, it takes an enormous amount of communication and, and, um, and coordination with each other. And I, I, it's by no means perfect, but I think the dollars are getting better. I think personally, one of the bigger challenges we have is the lines of accountability and responsibility on the issue of homelessness. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting to me is thinking about how, you know, when you have a, a system, you know, you're gonna need like an emergency management system or a public health system, someone designs how it should work and they know that these things need to be in place. Um, when we started working on homelessness, I mean, I started working at St. Stephen's Shelter in 1993. So just a couple of years after the first Wilder uh, survey, but you know, it was the early eighties and Dave, <laughs> Dave can remember this part better than, than me, but it was the early eighties when homelessness, the homelessness system we see today was really just a bunch of church basements opening up their doors and letting people in. Everybody thought it was gonna be temporary. Um, and that's what was happening all across the nation. And then over time, we're like, well, that's not temporary. So we have to add this and this and this. And then later we added this program and this funding stream. And mm -hmm. it is a hodgepodge of so many things that have come together over, the over time that now are called our homeless response system, but it was never designed. It, it was more responsive. And I think what so desperately is needed and it's difficult um, is to now pull apart, um, if we know what it now takes to end homelessness, which is to prevent it whenever possible. And if someone does become homeless, make sure we get them quickly out and make sure they have the supports they need to stay out but through both the right housing and the right services if needed. Um, if we know that, then how do we back up and design an actual response and system together, figuring out what's the state's role, what's the county's role, what's the city's role, what's the right. philanthropy's role in right. faith communities. And that is, that's <laughs> hard work, but really, really important. That's a lot of, a lot of uh, pieces to work together. Um, we're gonna be, we need to start wrapping up here in a few minutes. And uh, I wanna bring Michelle in and uh, to kind of help us understand how the study is funded and and give people an idea of, of how, um, if they're interested in, in helping to, to support um, financially the, the study. Michelle, can you help us understand, um, first of all, 
where does the money come from to, to fund the study and what can people do to help? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Oh my gosh. This has been so great. Wow. The time went by really quickly. Um, yeah. So um, as I said before, the foundation um, support as well as government support um, um, we are also um, broadening the study funding um, as well. So for this audience, first I wanna invite you um, to sign up to receive an email about the study. Um, we send out periodic updates to folks who are interested. Um, Carrie Walsh coordinates that. So you can go to www.mnhomeless.org. Isn't it great that we got that URL? That's pretty fun. <laughs> um, it's a great way to keep up to date on our study and, and learn about the volunteer opportunities, et cetera, um, advocacy work. Um, and this study, this 21, 20, 2021 study for the first time, um, we're really looking for outside donations as well. Um, last time we did this study, we had an 11 year old boy who did a fundraiser um, and came up with a couple hundred dollars for our study, which was awesome. And of course, uh, the sisters of Carondelet gave us a donation, but we didn't do any actual um, specific efforts to raise funds. And we don't want the study um, to not happen because of, of, of funding gaps. Um, so we invite um, folks to consider making a gift to support the implementation of the 2021 study. We have um, a generous donor who has offered a $5,000 match. Uh, dollar for dollar for support. Um, and you can make a gift online at um, mnhomeless.org. Our goal this year is to raise $25,000 to help this, to support this study. But any amount is appreciated, of course. Um, and then um, just lofting it over to our wonderful advancement team. Um, you can connect with them about potential gifts as well. And Rodenberg is amazing. And at Rodenberg <laughs> at wilder.org. And you can see her phone number here, 612-747-2772. Uh, she's available to help coordinate gifts from donor advised funds, IRAs, or stocks. Um, and, and it's just kind of exciting um, that we have this partnership with Advancement now to think about the long-term um, viability of this study and getting creative about funding and expanding it. Um, and I really appreciate Advancement's help on that. Um, and just wanna say, I really appreciate all of you being there that here. We couldn't do this study without our volunteers, all our funders, all our partners, these many people around the state who take the time to help us um, conduct this study. It's just, I'm really, really grateful for all of the support. Well, Michelle, thanks so much for that. And, uh, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I also wanna thank uh, Dave Schultz and Kathy Tenbrook for participating in this really important discussion. Um, of course, uh, if you have more uh, questions about how to get involved, you see the information there. Um, and so everybody, have a great day. Have a great week. Everybody stay safe and healthy, and we'll talk to you later.